as I told these two outstanding organizers, and the year-end meeting happens uh, once a year. It's an evaluation of where Canada Acorn has been last year, and they make plans for the coming year. They do some training. If you just walked in the door, you're not here, but most of the staff is here. Having it in Boston, wherever we were, Detroit, Boston, whatever, we try to get people together to give our Canadian brothers and sisters some perspectives on organizing both the history of this enterprise over the last uh, 45 years uh, or so, um, as well as, uh, you know, different, different ways of looking at the work. Um, and clearly being in Boston gives us some, uh, some rare opportunities to, to have some, some old friends uh, and comrades who uh, go back to various stages of history, both pre-ACORN that led to the development of ACORN in Bill's case. Uh, Bill originally recruited me as a uh, welfare rights organizer uh, in Springfield, Mass, back um, 1968 or so. Um, and then Mike Gallagher, and Bill has, uh, Bill and our past as organizers uh, have been consistent uh, over the last 44, 45 years. Uh, he built uh, not only mass welfare rights, but then left welfare rights, ended up uh, working to build a union, which that union, just as our unions did, came into SCIU. He then uh, ended up uh, building yet another local, and qu quite an interesting story. We may not get into all the details, but out in the Cape for many years, uh, finally so-called retired from the Cape, and then ended up working for the AFL-CIO and drives all over the country, including uh, when we were lucky enough to get him uh, detailed to the uh, Walmart campaign uh, in Florida, where uh, Bill got to see a yet a different beach um, on the Gulf Coast side, uh, <laughs> as opposed to all the other beaches that he'd, he'd love to, to get near. And then went on and was part of other uh, construction drives, asked me, I, ca I can't keep up, and um, um, still uh, keeps his eye on organizing. And uh, Michael uh, was part of our, has a long history as well with us, was part of the founding core of the United Labor Unions and uh, some of the work that preceded them out of Boston. Um, that was in 78, 79, 1980 was when we started the ULU locals. He worked in, uh, he had that rare experience within the United Labor Unions of working in every one of the cities, I think. And, That's right. Stories from the fast food campaigns in Detroit, from Chicago, from Philly and the strikes and rag picking, from New Orleans where he was uh, a great help to us in the hotel drives. And then I was able to get Mike to come back years later on the hot rock drives. Uh, so, and then he's, uh, as you know, some of you know this morning, he's now with uh, uh, SCIU Local 615 and he's part of who we called out to and said, hey, is there meeting space? And the confusing story of why Canada is here in Boston, you know, and he's <laughs> gone back with. That. It was, you know, you know it, luckily, there are some people you've known long enough, they don't need space. to know all the of details. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Canada, I don't get that, but whatever, Wade. Um, by the way, we, we welcome you to our, to our local union. This is uh, Local 615, the service employees union. Our members are working property service, meaning they're building janitors in all these buildings that you see, every one of them. Uh, about 18,000 members uh, uh, in commercial real estate and colleges and universities. We're, we're pleased to have Acorn Canada here with us. <laughs> yeah, woo woo. Thank you. That's right. The old maple leaf treatment. <laughs> so they keep saying, what are we really, what do you really want to talk about, Wade? What are we really supposed to do? They keep looking for the structure and organizational infrastructure behind this panel. I keep saying, <coughs> believe it or not, you know what? I'm interested in you talking about, uh, it's a dialogue, as uh, all of you are familiar with. I'm interested in you telling some stories about uh, uh, as factual as we can remember, and you know, some of these details and dates do get lost over time, but uh, um, 
So I'm hoping in Bill's case that he'll go back and walk us through uh, some of the, what you might say the roots of ACORN, which are absolutely uh, here in Boston and Springfield where Welfare Rights was working. And I've often told the story that luckily at 20 years old, I knew everything. Um, <laughs> So it was easy for me to, after a year with Welfare Rights, think I could, you know, start ACORN because I was 21 and I knew everything. Um, and it only turned out as you went year by year how little you freaking knew. Um, but that's uh, one of the strengths and weaknesses of youth. But Bill was uh, uh, the sort of eminence behind uh, and, and absolutely the founder and head organizer of Massachusetts Welfare Rights, which was... It's a bone of contention, but was without a doubt the largest of the welfare rights affiliates. Not that anybody cared about that, I don't think, than us. Um, and that was a, a bone of argument uh, in one national meeting after another. Um, uh, but Bill certainly, uh, you know, if you'd tell some of that story and anything else, and then when we get to Mike, uh, how we ended up getting from acorn to labor and labor back and forth and uh, some of the intersections there. We were talking on the phone just the other day. I, I made poor, <laughs> I warned him, but I told him about a book where he has, his name was in there as one of the key people in home care organizing. Of course, he immediately read the book and has already got issues and unhappy with the book, but that's just, you know, what you're going to well, find at this issue. end of the room. I have one issue with the book. <laughs> Wasn't mentioned enough. <laughs> That's right. I, but I'd warned him. His only name was in there they one right. time, and there are a lot of people whose name weren't in there at we're all. Gonna, we're going to set the record straight here tonight. <laughs> That's right. And it's going to be on YouTube. That's and right. It sounds like, uh, you know, Mike has become a YouTube aficionado. So what I'm hoping they'll do is uh, start with some of their uh, perspectives and stories and whatever. Um, and as is is our common practice as we get in there. Any wild and interesting questions that any of you have, I know we'll count on you to do, and eventually we'll stop it, either when the tape runs out or when they get tired or when we are finished with it. Bill, you want to start? Yeah, I usually stop when it gets dark. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, we, it's been being dark. <laughs> that, oh, got trouble now, Billy. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, from my standpoint, and... Uh, before I did welfare rights, I had worked for the welfare department in New York City. And I had done that for a year and a half, and so I had a certain familiarity with the way the welfare worked. I then ended up in a training program in Syracuse, which was run by Fred Ross and Solowinsky, who were two of the big names in organizing it. You have to say in organizing since these names don't go much further. Um, but... That's until Saul's new Beck. career as a right yes. wing Glenn, eminence. Glenn Beck. Might, yeah, now that he's a Tea Party favorite, I mean, he's got a whole second career. Frank Pippen is making it that way. That's right. It's a whole world that I just new career. Whipping boy at the right. That's right. But at any rate, so <coughs> in organizing in that training program, which was in 64, Five. The, um, the idea was to build local community organizations based on the, each community, build about 10 of them, and then put them together and then try to build an Olinsky organization after that so it would be more or controlled by the grassroots than to bring leaders in first. Um, and one of the groups I helped organize, our first issue was Easter clothing. And that's 1965. And meanwhile, and these were all wonderful organizers out of the civil rights movement who were in this program. Um, and so people were working on whatever issues you found when you were, you know, in each community. But so the group I was working with, we went down to the welfare and said we want at least a clothing. Um, and lo and behold, they gave people hundreds of dollars for Easter clothing. And this was in Syracuse? This is in Syracuse. When we came back and had a staff meeting and said this is what happened, people for the first time really looked at 
the constituencies that they were building as welfare recipients as compared to tenants or whatever. It just had, didn't click. And so the next week, there was a virtual riot where there were, it seemed like a riot. There were like 250, 300 people there demanding their Easter clothing and getting it. Um, what was striking to me was after Fred Ross, and people know the name Fred Ross, or is this just... Well, we still use some of the organizing papers, but... But he was like... The, the concept of house meetings, uh, key and he was finding the, and developing yeah, Chavez. Right. And, he was the real master who found Chavez knocking on his door and who uh, just was a great organizer, in my opinion. And so Fred was beside himself. What is this? Everything's supposed to be under control. This is not the way to behave. And it took years later before I understood what his problem was. Um, but meanwhile, we were left with you know, the, the beginning of a welfare rights movement that we didn't even know was a welfare rights movement at the time. And one of the things I have found in my life is I've missed many a movement, even though I was right there on the spot. <laughs> and a move, there is nothing like being part of a movement. But I was, uh, for instance, with, uh, the, with the farm workers, as they were going on their first strike, I went to Peace Corps. And Fred Ross is saying to me, oh, you've got to go down to the strike. And I said, well, when I come back in two years. When I came back in two years, I worked on the boycott. Mm -hmm. um, when, uh, in 1963, I think, it was Mississippi Freedom Democratic Summer, I had gone to Mexico for a uh, vacation. Coming back, this person on the bus says, I'm going to Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Why don't you come? And I said, well, you know, I don't know. I'm going back to New York to see my mother, you know. God, <laughs> um, and, and you could be right there on the spot and not see it or recognize it. Um, and it's often in retrospect that you realize it. And coming out of welfare rights, which was really a movement, we thought, as Wade describes, but it, all of us thought we were great organizers. People turned out, they demonstrated, they went to jail, they, we collected, it was, you go out there and you're 22 years old and you get the list, you're going to turn out 250 people and be marching on the welfare. Um, and so it was quite disappointing to find out that we weren't so great later <laughs> when I was started a union and found that people were saying, who needs you, you know, <laughs> what the hell are you doing here? And, and we, in fact, the charismatic leader of welfare rights, the guy by the name of Bruce Thomas, started a union with this union of hospital workers with me. And we spent two and a half years to lose an election five to one. Uh, and it would have been 40 years later before I realized what we should have done <laughs> in those days. Um, but at any rate, from, from doing the Syracuse training program, which really taught you the most basic thing. Fred Ross would go out with us. He'd door knock with you. He'd correct you. He'd, you'd go out, you do it. He'd do it. Um, he was very into the details of organizing. And, and, he, and he just loved the details and how to do it and thinking about it, you know, what moved people. What he didn't think moved power was trouble. He thought what moved power was voting, something which people of the 60s, and this is the mid-60s, did not think was necessarily, or at least was not the fun part of it. The fun part of organizing was demonstrating, making trouble. And Fred was in conflict with that. And, you know, he and just did not like it. When 
so I, and anyway, so I went down to Peace Corps for a couple of years, avoiding the draft. When I came back, I worked for six months with Fred again on the boycott. Very disappointing, horrible experience. My wife worked with Fred running the office, and she to this day can't stand Fred because of it. <laughs> and he's long deceased. <laughs> So and this is, this is 1968, and she still is pissed at me that I made it work with her. Um, but then, uh, well, one of the things that happened was, so they asked me after six months of working on the boycott, Boycott Buchanan in New York, was to run the New York boycott. Fred asked me, Caesar called up, said he'd like me to do it. Dolores Huerta had been there, who is a famous number two to Caesar Chavez. This is the Graves boycott. Mm -hmm. The Grape boycott, and the, yeah. And so, uh, so Dolores, I found to be an incompetent pain in the ass. And so I said to Caesar, I will do it if you get rid of Dolores. You know, get her out of here. And he said, Dolores is my vice president. And I went on to do welfare rights. 25 years later, <laughs> I got asked to be the head organizer for the Strawberry Campaign. And by this time, it was. They don't I, know about that campaign. I mean. But it was a, yeah. a big farm worker campaign. And, Strawberries in Northern California. And the, the head organizer, or the head of the union then, is. Artie. Artie Rodriguez. And he says, we. We, you know, we'd like you to do this, and I said, so I'll do it son -law. as long as you guarantee that Dolores isn't going to negotiate the contract. And he said, Dolores is my vice president. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are disappointments in this work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at, and, uh, and I paid my dues. You know, I worked twice for them, and then my son worked in, as a head researcher for the Strawberry Campaign. Just to, so that the constituency really looked good, but uh, the work wasn't so good. Um, so, anyway, so then I came to work for welfare rights. Welfare rights, they just, George Wiley was the head of welfare rights. He said, if you want to, he said, you can work anywhere in the country. I just got a grant. I've never paid an organizer. You'll be the first organizer. Pick wherever you want. Um, I asked my wife where she wanted to live, and we went and went to Boston. We had no idea whether it was a good place or a bad place to organize. We had no researcher who went in first to say what's happening. Nothing. Years later, I realized we had just picked the right time and the right place. And one of the things that was happening was they were switching from local control, which would mean, let's say, you know, Boston or Springfield were all separate welfare offices with reasonably separate rules to a statewide operation. And so their ability to communicate with each other was less than our ability to communicate with each other as organizers. And so if we would win something in Boston today, by tomorrow the, we had marches in North Adams or in Springfield or throughout the state. And the welfare directors would go out of their minds that they never heard of this, how could this be, and yet it was true. Um, and so, but we had picked, which nowadays, the unions at least send in researchers first and figure out what's a good place, what's, what are the issues, they do a lot of pre-work before you spend your money on organizers and bring them in. And they kind of decided, after years of experience with organizers, that they needed somebody smart in these campaigns, and it sure wasn't going to come out of the organizers. And so they started bringing in researchers to head things up. Um, in, the, in welfare rights, so when I got here, it was just me and one, one contact from a minister and an old group called Mothers for Radical Welfare that was, had some very tough ladies who thought they were the welfare 
group to be. Um, and it, and in starting to, and they they gave me a very hard time. Those few <laughs> ladies. <laughs> um, and he suffered them gladly, mm, as you can tell. But they had a structure, which they liked, which was they were the leaders, and there was one group. When I came in, I started making groups in, in different neighborhoods, and so, and I would. You know, and so we door knocked like eight areas and said that they were going to all be, you know, Cambridge Mothers Radical Welfare and Boston Mothers Radical Welfare and Grove Hall MAW and so on. And so they went with it. And then we have our first demonstrations trying to get furniture and, furniture and household supplies. And at the first demonstrations, these leaders look and see how many people there are. And there were, you know, I'd say 1,500 between the eight groups, um, and said, I don't care what you call it, but it ain't more. This ain't us. And forevermore, we were enemies, but they were out, and we just changed the name to Grove Hall Welfare Rights Organization. And just had a reasonable monopoly. They and what year was that, Billy? This is 68. Mm -hmm. And so when Bill is telling the story about Syracuse in 65, welfare rights was begun by Wiley by putting together this mosaic of groups June 30th of 66. Right. So that was his Syracuse story actually predates the building of National Welfare Rights Organization or uh, Wiley's attempt there. And then you were down two years later to try to start putting it on the ground. Yeah, and it was, and, and there were tremendous conflicts with Wiley, and Wiley was not an organizer, he was a chemistry, chemistry professor. professor at Syracuse. But had been in core, and a very mm -hmm. respectable kind of guy, nice guy, and hated what he saw mm -hmm. as the manipulation of organizers to make trouble. He thought the welfare rights really should be controlled by welfare recipients and that everything should be nice. But he was also pretty good at taking, when the ladies gave him more shit because he was black, then they gave me and our fellow workers who were white. And they, um, and he could take a lot of it, of uh, abuse, <coughs> to, to <coughs> abuse. Um, but then moved forward and was great at fundraising. And so, and the trick, as I saw it through an organizer is, how do you get enough fundraising to be able to do your work? And, and that, you know, we were pretty lucky in Massachusetts because we had a number of rich ladies who lived there. And George Wiley was also gonna get money sent into Massachusetts. And because of success, in terms of turning out people and making trouble. And we had the unique thing that they wanted, which was integrated in the sense of there were white and blacks in motion, although granted in separate little groups. Um, it was, uh, we were funded well, but forevermore, it taught me a lesson about that you have to worry about funding, mm -hmm. and which made me like the union organizing because that gave permanent funding. Um, and dues check off. God bless it. Uh, and, but at any rate, so in welfare rights, it was now 1968, we got unbelievably talented people who came to work, mainly as VISTA volunteers who were assigned different places, but who came with a radicalism and a talent and an unlimited energy to work as organizers, and who wanted to be organizers, who wanted to learn the trade. Um, I mean, to find Wade was like a miracle, right? We're in Boston, and Wade is in, and I hear from this woman, Dee Dee, there are five organizers in Springfield, or North, no, in, I think it was North Adams, Summer, Vistas, which I didn't even know there was such a thing, 
And one of them looks really good, Wade. And so I met Wade at, the, at a demonstration in uh, Boston. Uh, and Wade was out there organizing groups in the western part of the state. And more militant than our groups in Boston, faster and bigger. Largely because I didn't know it better at all. Right. I mean, I remember telling Wade, uh, Wade, you know, those boots and that long hair, you know, it's... Not going to work. just ain't going to cut it. <laughs> That's right. And, and he just said, fuck you, <laughs> and went on with the I Actually, I did fuck you. I didn't say fuck you. I, mean, I just ignored him. Actually, what I said to Bill is Bill was wearing his uniform, which is probably still much like that, which was khaki pants and a khaki shirt and... You know, maybe, I don't think the suspenders were on yet, but uh, he had a certain, and I said, you dress like that, and you're going to tell me how to dress? I don't think so. And, and so we just went our separate ways, but. But it was, <laughs> a, you know, and one of the things that was interesting to me, in, again, after the fact, was Wade was moving these people who were outside of Boston and they were new because already we had done six months of organizing in the Boston area. And so they had that vigor of the beginning. And yet the state, after six months of putting up with the vigor at the beginning there, was now starting mm. to get ready to come back at us. And I remember going to one of the reporters at the Globe and saying, there's going to be a riot in Springfield. And I had no way to stop it. And I could just see it coming. Wade was planning these big demonstrations, and the state was coming down on me on the eastern part of the state like crazy. And sure enough, there was a total full-scale riot in Springfield. Um, and predictable and unstoppable without, you know, just because of the dynamic of the way the organizing had come about. Um, in welfare rights, one, one of the things that we did is so that everyone would get their own group. And the way we did organizing in welfare rights was we would get a list. A thing you no doubt learned is crucial for all organizing. Um, and so you'd get a, I, I remember just being able to walk, walk into the New Bedford office, look in all the offices and pick out of a social worker and say, I'm from Welfare Rights, I'll see you at lunch. And then we'd meet at lunch and I'd have the list. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, as in our first demonstrations in Welfare Rights, which were sit-ins for furniture, we had what we would call the radical social workers, which sit in with us. And, and they would run the telephones and they would, you know, be very helpful. Sometimes when we were, as we went later in the program, we, you'd have a demonstration, you'd win, the other side's giving up, but all the social workers had gone home and there was no one to write out the checks, no one to write out for the money. And so the radical social workers would stay to, make, to put in the money and stuff. And we had a number of people like the radical social <coughs> workers who were helpful. This was not just poor people in motion. We had the head of the social workers union, the head of the National Association of Social Workers. We had um, a, who else? Like, but we had oh, like clergy folks. Cler lots, lots of clergy who would door knock. This was a time when priests yeah, were. Right and nuns were trying to figure out whether they were gonna stay in the church or not. And their last gas was to work with poor people and see if the church is with Christ, which, you know, and believed in poor people, what Christ said about poor people, and they all, of course, had to leave once that. They tried that thing. <laughs> this was um, their last gas. <laughs> hey, it was worth a shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But at any rate, so after building the, all these organizations and all these demonstrations, a number of organizers went on to 
other areas, you know, so that, you know, so that we had a guy named Mark Splain, who, I don't know how many of the people you know, but probably. No, that's why y'all are here. This is okay. all good history. So we had people who went to, this guy went and did Rhode Island, and we had someone <coughs> go to Vermont, and we had someone go to Minnesota. We had a welfare rights leader go to Minnesota. Um, we had uh, a number of other states, and and basically, it was very fast. Like it was within a year and a half. The year and a half I spent there was um, we had done lots of organizing, made lots of trouble, and spread those organizers besides what else was going on in the country to a good number of places in the country. And you had this sense that you were a wonderful organizer and you could really, you know, and move the world and, and that we'd make the revolution. When you look back and you say you're working with this hated little group, <laughs> the chances didn't, wouldn't have looked so good. Uh, when I left... But at the time, we were the largest poor people's organization in the country. I read that on the mm -hmm. brochure and I must, signed up. Must be so. hey, there, That's all I needed. <laughs> there was... It was so much better than SDS. Let's go that way. There's a Black United Front in Boston, which had all these black groups. And when we said, well, we want to be part of it because we had all, a lot of black groups in welfare rights. We had 35 groups, probably 30 of them were black. They wouldn't let us in because we'd because. take over the whole thing right. on the numbers. And so they, they would not permit us to be part of that. The, after a year and a half in welfare rights, I ended up going to graduate school you know, towards, in the doctoral program, uh, which I lasted about a month, and then went on to do other things like tenant organizing and then eventually union organizing. Um, when I left, Wade took my place as head organizer in welfare rights, despite the fact that he was two years younger than anybody else in the place. <laughs> um, Wade, I don't know if he's ever described the kind of troubles we had because Wade's constituency was in the western part of the state and the old leaders in the <coughs> eastern part of the state were really not ready to make this exchange. <laughs> we organizers just decided and they decided <coughs> who the hell are we to decide. Right. Um, and Wade then went on to do ACORN. When I started the union, and I'll end this quickly, um, I got $50,000 from SEIU to start a union of hospital workers in Massachusetts. I started with about five old welfare rights organizers. Um, and we had no experience, but we knew we had to be better than those old white guys who were doing these unions. And we failed terribly for more than two years. Um, and then ended up, and I, and I had a vision, which was that we get the dues, and then we do community organizing, you do housing, you do whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, for years and years, I called myself uh, community organizing, doing unionship. And then, but I was wrong about the community organizing being quite that loose. And what happened was that it turned out that you could get your union members very interested in community organizing around healthcare, because mm -hmm. they were hospital mm -hmm. workers, right. they were nursing home workers. And so tying the union into a Cape Cod healthcare coalition working on Medicaid issues, working on access issues, uh, tying into nursing homes and working with Cape United elderly, old people organizing, um, it just worked and worked well. And you were able to really, and it wasn't, you also could get funding for some of the stuff, but you always had the steady stream of money, you had your Xerox machines, you had everything you needed to do the work on, you know, for, out of the union. Um, 
eventually you find there are major disadvantages with unions. One being that uh, you can't, every, the final power is not yours. I had a lot of freedom as head of a local to be able to make a lot of decisions. But over time, the international was saying, you have to merge with somebody else. Over time, they were saying, you can't do mass general. That's somebody else's who doesn't want to do it, but you can't go into that territory. And there was all this kind of stuff that was tremendous disadvantage to the union. But the bottom line was we were able to do a lot on the Cape Part of the Cape is the eastern part of Massachusetts. Um, in terms of wages and benefits for workers, career ladders for them, and then changing health care a great deal in, in not only Massachusetts, but nationally. And one of the other interesting things about it was that when they Cape Cod is, was a Republican area in a very democratic state, in a very conservative area. And so we're able to take on issues, like in the South, no doctors would take Medicaid recipients, you know, none of the eye doctors. And, um, and so you're able to take an issue like that, which is unbelievably piggy, and confront a democratic government in Boston and really get results. Right. And so there was that kind of dichotomy was very useful in the work. Um, and anyhow, so I ended up doing welfare rights and then for 20, uh, uh, doing the union for 25 years. And then they kept insisting that I bargain for them. One of the problems is when do you start letting the workers decide? If you organize the first worker, do you let them tell you what to do? Is it the 10th worker? Is it the 100th worker? Is it the 1,000th worker? But at any rate, I had, by the time I left, there were 3,500 members, and they were all saying, you've got to negotiate our contracts. And so I went to work for the AFL, thinking I could hop around the country organizing hot shops. Um, and it turned out they didn't do much organizing. Mm -hmm. There weren't that many hot shops they were interested in. Um, and they didn't control. And I learned that being head of a local is great compared to working for the AFL. Um, but it is now 45 years since I began in this work. Um, and it was fun. And it was exciting. And I and you could really feel like you made a difference. Um, I don't think I changed America, but I think if you're a poor person, go live on Cape Cod. It's a good place to be now. <laughs> um, and it was, and it was, there was a lot to be said for this as a career, uh, and to, which I knew that from the beginning. I knew from the beginning this was a thing I could do the rest of my life and enjoy. And it was the only thing I was ever good at. You know, I never was good at anything else in particular. You were accounting, Bill. I majored in accounting in college, <laughs> and I was good, good at, at numbers. <laughs> but I, it was really the only numbers. thing I, I really, from the second I did it, I really liked it. And for no other reason, because Fred Ross used to say, and I'll end right here, you have to say the same thing to everybody. You knock on the door and you say, there are three kinds of power. There's the power of money, and we ain't never going to have it. And there's the power of numbers, and we're going to have that at the first meeting. And there's the power of the vote, and we're going to do that, register you for vo voters after. And so all of a sudden, I could relate to people. Just knock on the door, I knew exactly what to say. I said it over and over and over again. Got to know people really well. and. You got to fight with people, and you got to go to jail with people, and you got to sit in with people, and you got, and it was, and, it, and when I think back now to that very first time, you know, the first organization I built in Syracuse, when I left, I couldn't stop crying for two days. 
and it just I had built a relationship that wasn't real in terms of a friendship, but it was something that I had just never experienced before with people. And it just hurt to leave. And that sense and that sense of being with people <coughs> has really lasted 45 years. And is just, and I, I, in a way, I think that's the important question in some ways is how long are you going to stay with this? Are you going to be able to succeed and hang in for years and years? Because it takes a long time to learn how to do this right. And even then, there's much to be learned. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, we have um, something special for the presenters. Should we do that after? Oh, we do it after. Okay. <clears throat> well, and I'm gonna we'll get Bill to tell some other stories that I can I can help him with later. But Mike, why don't you uh, yeah, pick up ten years later? I, I have a question for both Bill and Wade. And <laughs> this is the transition from welfare rights to. You went down to Arkansas. Uh, Mark Splain, who Bill talked about, stayed here in Massachusetts and built different kinds of organizations, kind of not really more multi-issue, uh, more low and moderate income. Was there, and Bill, you too, was there analysis that said we're going to leave the exclusively poor people organizing behind and move on to something else? Well, Bill, uh, Bill will probably have a different answer, but I mean, what happened in the period I ran welfare rights after Bill left is the governor at that time, Francis Sargent, partially in reaction to the huge success we'd had in developing what uh, we called special needs campaigns, mm -hmm. minimum standard campaigns, similar to the exercise we talked about in Vancouver here a couple of uh, months ago with Scott and Marcus and John, because they're doing a very similar derivation of that in terms of disability benefits now. So all of a sudden I was able to say, you know what? I just had to stumble through coming back from Japan. I actually can help you all on this. I've actually, here's some scars I can show. You know, I'll show you how to do the forms. Bill would have loved to have been there that day. But what happened is coming off of all this stuff, and Bill's analysis is actually fairly interesting about, you know, all I knew from nothing is that they were coming, you know, we were winning in Springfield, but weren't able to win mm -hmm. winter coats. And sort of, it's all a very simple world. It's October 15th, there's a riot, you still can't win. Right. But then when Sargent proposed a flat grant, you had this contradiction. At one level, you could say that was a huge victory. He was talking about raising the basic benefit for all families on mm -hmm. welfare to a set rate that was much higher than it was then. But we actually opposed it because he was eliminating special needs, which, which were our organizing right. tools. That's right, how right, we right. got these numbers. That's what, you know, people fought for, went to jail with it or whatever. So he was sort of, if we had been about simply welfare policy, it was a huge victory. Mm -hmm. If we were about building an organization, not so much. Not so, much. so yeah. to me, that was, uh, you know, you kind of think in that period of time, as I've already admitted, you think you know a lot that you don't. But... The political analysis was, even in Boston, there was only one, one out of this huge welfare concentration in 69-70, one out of seven residents were on welfare in Boston at that time. But you were dealing with a minority constituency. So my simple, what did I learn? You better organize a majority constituency way, because, you, you know, if, mm -hmm. if winning yeah. like we were winning in welfare yeah. rights meant we were losing the organization even as we won policy, you had to get to a bigger constituency. And that's sort of what I thought, oh, we're not doing that right in welfare rights. I'll go do this ACORN thing, which is low and moderate. And, um, you know, Mark, I guess, took over after I left at welfare rights, no? no I don't think so. I think it was no, there was, it was probably. No, there was no African-American guy. Uh, tried it for a while. What was his Baldwin? name? Huh? Tony Bolden? Yeah. And then Mark came in, that didn't work out. I think Mark came in within six months. He was in graduate school and then came in after he got out of graduate school, right? Sounds right. Yeah, and then he had a couple of cups of coffee and he was gone. I mean, by that point, the world <laughs> was, was all changing. Guys. Yeah. But then and I think they were coming up with the same conclusions I was, as was Wiley at that point. When he died in 73, he'd just been to Arkansas and 
hung out and stayed at the house and whatever, and he knew somehow we were, you couldn't see us winning what we were trying to win. They had the national fight for, you know, FAP campaign, right. which was the same thing with Nixon, where same they'd opposed right. a, a flat grant. In retrospect, I'm not sure we did the same thing, you know, we did the right thing. If we should have taken it and run, I mean, who would have known Nixon was a, you know, yeah, it was a, a deal, liberal Republican as opposed to, yeah. you know, what we now see is possible. But. And Bill, same, you you said, we're not going to do this anymore, we're going to do this. No. No. I, um, it's just... The Wade's moving to Arkansas and doing that was seen as strange and different. And nobody else was saying that except George. Well, Mark was. Not not that, that not time. Right away, not right away. Yeah, but not within a year or two, yeah. Mark and, and Lee and But and, it was uh, it was the Acorn model which mm -hmm. George Wiley decided was the right way to go and he wanted to be the head of all poor people instead of the head of welfare recipients. And he and, and he was just a good guy about letting Wade do it that way. <laughs> Just like he let us do what we did in Massachusetts, he just said, okay, let's try that. And he liked it and he thought it was the right thing. To his peril. Because within six months, Johnny and Beulah and all them, Catherine, I mean, they, within six months, figured out much the same thing as the Maws did. Whoa, we don't want this low and moderate and call these people. We just want a trade union of welfare recipients, right. women on welfare, maybe right. a couple of these guys, disabled right. guys and drunk guys. They're okay, but basically we want a women's union. This is our thing. On wealth. This is our thing. With all this other, you know, these Not so much. other people who, you know, they may only be making a couple more dollars, but whatever. We don't want that. So 13 to 1 was our vote. We disaffiliated from welfare rights as they were kicking us out at the same mm -hmm. time and <laughs> shook everybody's hand and there you go. It just, yeah. They had their group. But there was not, other welfare rights groups were not becoming ACORN. No. No, no, no. It did not I go know. like that at all. Yeah. Um, no, I they, mean, we, within welfare rights, for instance, we had the golden age welfare rights. We had these old people trying to, you know, work on utilities and we had the wage supplement organization where we went to New Bedford and tried to organize right. Mm -hmm. Working That's people to go on the welfare, um, and <laughs> if you know, we had a hammer; it was all a nail. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, but but we were. There was no, and, and one of the things we certainly were accused of in those days, perhaps correctly, was at least for me. I wasn't making any analysis. I was. Organizing, raising hell, and loving every minute of it. And just following your instincts. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, you know, I would not say that I was there figuring out, oh, the next step the next. is going to be a union, and that's the working class, and that's where the action is. I see. You know, I mean, even... Yeah, I was at least able to right. get my mouth wrapped around you something more different than Bill. Than that, right? Bill would get into these <laughs> horrific <laughs> arguments with, in my brief career of with the other, his, you know, compatriots in Brooklyn or whatever, and in Brooklyn they decided, and we love these women, they decided we could really keep welfare rights alive. We wouldn't have this problem of what you're having in fucking Massachusetts, the year, you know, mammy fucking stuff, but if they had a better ideology, if the women really understood what they were doing. Well, one thing, no problem. One thing about those of us who kind of... They'd say, well, let me just finish the story. They'd say, Bill, you probably really believe this adequate income thing, and he'd say... <laughs> I'll settle. <laughs> right, right. Which is a whole other way. If we went out of so what income. If I'd you settle. were around in the '60s, there were a bazillion groups, especially in student organizing. You know, Maoists and progressive labor, and they all had this heavy analysis, and they would put out leaflets that, you know, legal size, written out to the margins. Like, I never, I never had any time for that stuff. I couldn't. I couldn't follow it all. Uh, um, you know, it it cheers me to hear you say that. Well, but you're just sort of following your nose, right? And it's about well, but the organizers. Uh, Tom Glynn came out of SDS. Jerry Shea was SDS. What, were you SDS? Also? Yeah. I mean. I mean that's how me or whatever. What was her name? Uh, who found me? I mean, I organized. Uh, Didi. Yeah, Didi. I'd organized the. Uh, Student walkout over the Black Student Union at Williams. So, 
So you had organized two, draft we had one of those too. Huh? <laughs> we had one of those too. All right. Well, everybody had one. Yeah. And that just happened to be my brief See, we academic were not, career. We were not harassed by the radicals because they knew they from nothing no from, from right. welfare recipients. Yeah. And by the time they noticed, we were strong enough to mm -hmm. maintain our. Well, day. and if, if Bill had been a little more hip, I mean, we were organizing Lumpen Proletariat, which nobody cared about. So we just were on the nobody, wrong side of the political nobody, analysis. Literally so nobody. Once they figured out we actually could, you know, disrupt <laughs> shit, oh, they, they could get a new line going. But by that time, we were gone yeah, and out. Right, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, so the stories we could tell. But tell a story, Mike. All right. I'll tell my story. Uh, so. I'm like, wait, I actually finished college uh, right about the same time, <laughs> 1970. And my first job um, was with a group in Chicago founded by a Catholic priest that uh, focused on housing on the west side and the south side, um, African-American families buying their houses on installment contract, like you buy a refrigerator. You miss a payment, you lose the house. Uh, no equity until the final payment 30 years down the road. So, um, and like Bill, I miss the movement part of it. Um, by the time I got there, it wasn't so much about blocking evictions and uh, Black Panthers with guns up on the roof and moving the furniture back in when the sheriff moved you out. And, uh, if you lost the house, in the end, you would come back at night and set it on fire. I missed all that stuff. When I got there, it was a federal lawsuit, which basically doing research on it took, I stayed for a couple years, a year and a half, but got really bored with it. And the lawsuit went on for, I think, seven years after I left. And, and what was the name of the group? The Contract Buyers League. Right. Which and Mark worked out too. Yes. Um, and eventually the, the lawsuit was thrown out of court uh, as it, just as it was to go to the jury. And the judge said he didn't see any violation of the law here at all. So, okay. <laughs> anyway, I was long gone by now. So I, um, I um, moved back east and went to work for the Service Employees Union in Rhode Island and actually knew Bill back in the day uh, just when you were getting your charter. Uh, I'd been hired by SEIU based on nothing but the fact that I had worked for Contract Buyers League, and there was an article in Atlantic Monthly about Contract Buyers League, and they said, oh, you must know something about what you're doing. I was 22. I knew nothing. <laughs> and I got no training either. So in Rhode Island... Which was actually fairly common at that time. Yeah. Right. Even in so welfare rights. You, you look like you know what you're doing here. You go out there. Hello. So Call me maybe. Uh, Rhode Island had just passed uh, a bill that gave collective bargaining rights to hospital workers in, in the U.S. up until, this was in 1972, it wasn't until two years later that our national labor laws were amended in such a way that hospital workers for the very first time had a legal right to organize. Uh, but anyway, I went out there with no training, no nothing, I think, uh, you know, the organizing director had one brief conversation with me and said, try to find the conscientious objectors and work with them. That was it, you know, that was okay, so I couldn't find one. And consequently, you know, I uh, floundered for a year or so at that job and decided I needed to go back to, to graduate school. And by the time I came out, um, Mark Splain, who uh, both Wade and Bill had mentioned, had here founded something similar to ACORN, a multi-issue, um, low and moderate income organization um, called Massachusetts Fair Share. And Fair Share um, at that point was you know, maybe a year or two into its life and uh, had chapters in three towns, but was on the verge of a rapid expansion uh, because uh, right at that time, uh, canvassing was invented. Bill talked about funding. Well, canvassing was the great new thing, and actually it was an environmental group in Chicago that invented it, and it's 
knocking on doors and asking for money. It's not that complicated, but <laughs> and uh, it all took of them a while. know exactly what you're talking about it now. It took a while. <laughs> well, you know, it, this was a this was a discovery then. This was 1975, I think. <coughs> and so, um, fair share took off like a rocket, and we uh, organized. We merged with another competing group here, uh, kind of a shotgun wedding arranged for us by the the Catholic Church and their campaign for human development. And, you know, we organized around housing and foreclosures and electric rates and auto insurance and all sorts of things. But <coughs> by oh, 1978 or so, we were pretty burned out on where the, the direction of the organization uh, wanted to get back to um, uh, a different kind of organizing, and so when um, when Mark uh, and Wade hooked up on this notion of, well, let me look at, look at it this way. So, in somebody once said that in literature there's only seven plots. I mean, you've all heard that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, lots of stories, but seven plots in organizing. There's really only seven, eight, I don't know how many categories of t kinds of organizing you can do or issues that you can organize around. There's housing, education, health care, uh, you know, environment, a couple others. So w Wade and, and Mark were very interested at that time in uh, uh, looking at employment. As a, as so it was a, 1978 yeah, Carter 1978, recession. That's right. Right. And so, um, you know, when you think about it, um, employment is the biggest transfer payment program in the country. It's not welfare or social security or anything else. That's where the exchange is made. So um, we formed a kind of alliance with Acorn. Uh, and fair share to go off in a new direction uh, for a year experimented with organizing welfare recipients, unemployed people, young people around summer jobs, uh, part-time or rather temporary CETA employees. CETA was a comprehensive employment training thank you. administration. I've forgotten what it stood for. Yeah. Uh, but they were, it was a government jobs program of sorts, but it had a it had a, a six-month termination on it, and then they would cycle you out of the job and cycle somebody else into the job. It's kind of a crazy scheme. And we had a notion, too, at the same time that what we really wanted, what we wanted to focus on as well, was organizing low-wage workers into unions. Um, and after a year or so of some successes, some failures. Um, we had, for instance, in many cities, Philly and here, we had, we had thousands of kids turn out for marches for summer jobs. They were wild and crazy events. Did, there was one in New Orleans, right? Well, there was one, in, yeah, in New in Orleans where right. Maureen's uh, yeah. husband got arrested and yeah. all that problem. There was and we actually, Philly, had, we I actually got arrested won some, on. We won some victories. I mean, we won some yeah, but they were yeah. need a job flyers. These yeah, were not exactly. campaigns. It was, These were just, it was pretty. This was just throwing it up against the wall. And then we would we would we would drive the bus. We would drive school buses on the day of the action. We would drive rent school buses and drive them up to the high school, like all, high schools all over town. Get on the bus for jobs. Put on the flyers. <laughs> you know, it was. We weren't weathermen. We didn't no. run in there it and was, disrupt and blackboard stuff. We just. It was pretty. Need a job. Get anyway, <laughs> so a year of that, uh, and we began to sort of buckle down on that low-wage worker thing and organizing union and founded uh, an organization uh, called United Labor Unions. Unfortunate name, I'd say. It's not That's the most creative still name. Ours, it's still so. out there, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, Local 100 and, is back wearing um, that shirt. You know, at that time, Wade... I first met Wade in 78 or 79, and he was in New Orleans doing some very interesting work with domestic workers, um, pe cleaning ladies, maids who worked for upper income people on the lakeside, right? It was a classic southern employment. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And not just Southern. Yeah, but everywhere. I mean, right. we had a lot in the South. Um, job. Those workers had been marginalized and excluded from uh, not just labor laws and the right to organize, they were excluded from basic coverage by the minimum wage laws of the country. But anyway... Until 1978. That's right. That's right. And that's what prompted well, you to go was, out there. And that was our organizing handle. That's we would right. Go out at that's those right. bus stops at dawn. See, it's all coming. It's all coming clear to me now. I, well, I, I only read the book last night. <laughs> See, a lot of times you are doing stuff without, you know, complete knowledge and complete analysis. But anyway, uh, so um, we. I spent some time in New Orleans, um, and then, you know, I thought it was curious that the ULU was hot shopping at these small and disparate sort of employment opportunities. Uh, what was it, Sun something? I, I didn't even know what they did. But in what city? In New Orleans. Sun? I didn't even know what it was, but we had a, <laughs> we had, got our ass kicked in a board election. Yeah, I don't remember uh, that. Anyway, we got kicked. Um, Luckily, the memory memory is still and forgiving. <laughs> it it seemed to me that 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 was not the way to grow an organization. That what we needed to do was sort of focus on an industry like the unions before us, the United Auto Workers Union or the Garment Workers. Uh, I mean, they organized industrially, not by trade or occupation, but um, and that that the the key industry in New Orleans wasn't, um, you know, this warehouse or that factory. It was the hotel industry. Uh, and then in other cities, um, we also tried to focus on what was, you know, what was the thing? Where was our niche? Who could we go out and organize the, uh, that wanted and needed to be organized? In Boston, we kind of came upon it accidentally, but um, we were doing a campaign to raise the state minimum wage, and we had our petition, and we were out there. Um, this was in like 1980. Uh, the, we were in the subways with our petition, and the subway stop is like two blocks from here where we met Golden Townsend, this older uh, African-American woman. He said, you know, sign our petition, we're looking to organize, you know, low-wage workers. He says, shit, low-wage workers? I know where there's 500 of them who meet every Friday afternoon to pick up their paycheck. He says, well, what's that? He says, what do you do? He says, we're, I'm a home care worker. What's that? We take care of old people and disabled people in their house. We work for an agency called Suburban Homemaking and Maternity. So sure enough, we go out to this place on check day, Friday, um, and sure enough, a steady stream, this is a very white suburb, steady stream of older black and Latino women going to pick up their checks. We're just sitting back and watching this thing. Come back the next week with our union cards. And the thing took off like a rocket. People, we were signing people up on the sidewalk in front after of a one-minute conversation. <laughs> it's like, we're about, we're union? Building, Give me that, boy. We're building a union of home health workers. Sign the card, come to the meeting. It didn't even have Bill's three points from Fred Ross. <laughs> he didn't need no rap. If we had napkins, we could have signed people up on napkins. So um, within, you know, a couple weeks, um... We'd signed up a ton of people and built to our first meetings. Um, you know, these are um, people who had no common workplace. So we're bringing them together for the first time, and, you know, people would get up and literally, you know, cry and saying, you know, I've been working for this company for five years or 12 years or whatever, and the saddest thing is I don't know any, I don't know any of the other people in this room, but we're coworkers. And the job paid minimum wage, uh, no nope, health insurance, no sick days, no nothing. Um, and it turned out that, that these women were, in many cases, veterans of struggles that went before us, 
Many of them were had been active in welfare rights. Now they were older and their kids were gone. Um, many of them had participated in hospital and nursing home campaigns. Uh, one of our leaders, um, early leaders in the home care work, had uh, sat in in a hospital, Jewish home on the Parkway, for three, <coughs> three days. This was before the hospital law was passed. She sat in for, for three days and nights with hundreds of her co-workers to win the right to an election, which they then proceeded to lose by one vote. Uh, she was an amazing woman. Um, but we quickly um, built majority at this one place with 500 workers, won a board election, uh, went on to win elections in a number of other agencies and organized within three, four, five months a thousand people. Then it became time to stand and deliver. We needed to produce a result for these people. We needed to bargain a contract, right? It wasn't just about organizing for the fun of it. We are trying to move some money from here to here. Uh, and this was all state-funded work, but the um, the agencies that people work for, um, some of them for profit, some of them non profit, um, were not, they were the employers, but not really the decision makers about, about the funding. So um, we negotiated a contract uh, with one agency, it became a model for others, um, but when we came to the original company that we'd organized, the one with the out in the suburbs, we couldn't get them to move at all on anything. And so under our labor laws here, once you win an election for the union, you have one year to produce a contract or your certification, the, the blessing that comes with the results of that election is gone and you have to start all over again. So. It was, what are we going to do now? And so there wasn't anything left to do but strike. And there had never been a, a strike in home health care. As I say, there's no common workplace. So it was certainly going to be a different kind of thing. So the first day of the strike, you know, we get hundreds of workers out there. And the first thing that we did was go to the back of the office, the, the company office, and cut their phone lines so that they couldn't talk to anybody. Um, um, the, we set up a picket line but didn't stay there because there's no work going on there. That's not, we're not <laughs> stopping production. The production is out, out in hundreds of homes of elderly and disabled people. So uh, every day we would meet at the place, that's where everything started, but the buses would always be there and we would get on the bus and go do an action somewhere, sit in, uh, sit in at the Department of Elder Affairs, we had a huge sit in, at, it happened that the, this was in November of 1982 I think, and it happened that that was an election year for governor. We took over the governor's re-election campaign office and stayed there for an entire day, um, demanding, street, demanding to see. Uh, we wanted to see the Secretary of Elder Affairs, and the cops came. Uh, back then, there was this thing called the TPF, the Tactical Police Force. These guys in uh, their blue, light blue helmets and motorcycles and they brought the squad, the uh, paddy wagons and the dogs and everything else and so they, the head cop goes up to our head leader and she says, he says, lady, if you don't get these people out of here in the next five minutes, we're going to arrest you all. And these are, these are grandmothers. So most of them were church ladies, but this lady in particular, she was from New York. Most of them were from the deep south, but she was from New York and she had a scar on her, chi on her chin, on her cheek that went from here to here. She wasn't, she wasn't going to mess around with anything. She said to the cop, listen, you do that. You go ahead and arrest us. You drag us out of here with dogs and all that shit. And it'll be on the news tonight. And then see if the governor thanks you for your service for that. 
they went, the police went and had their powwow. Said maybe this isn't a good idea. Maybe want to Instead, the, they, the governor's reelection office, meanwhile, was frantic. They located the Secretary of Elder Affairs on Cape Cod and put him on a helicopter to bring him back here to talk to us. And by that time, we said we, well, we didn't really want to talk to him anyway, and we all went home. But so he's a, he was yeah, on a helicopter. Work. But anyway. Uh, so at the so we're out for three solid weeks, uh, and because it's home care, and because people actually do care about their clients, many of our members were going to work the whole time, looking in on their clients, making sure they were okay, and then coming out on the action. They just weren't getting paid. They just weren't getting paid. They weren't putting in their time. They were scabbing themselves. They were scabbing Scab themselves. <laughs> right. So they were protecting their job. Just. In a volunteer way. In a volunteer way. Right. <laughs> so at the end of the strike, you know, our committee worked hard. They come back, and we have this big meeting. And the committee gets up to announce the results. Here's 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 the deal. And it's no wage increase, no sick days, no holidays, no nothing. All we won was modified union shop, and if you're watching this uh, right to work <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, brouhaha that's going on in, in Michigan, it's, it's about union security. It's about you know, whether people are going to be required to pay dues or not. What modified union shop meant was that those who were currently employed didn't have to pay dues at all if they didn't want to, but all new hires had to. Anyway, that's all we won. And so, there's this crowd of people, you know, stunned silence. We've been